All right. Problem number seven. This is the one that had a wheel. It's spinning two and a half revolutions per second. Two, two and a half times around every second. And it's divided up into eight sections because there's eight spokes. So you can think of uh, each section as being like a, a pie wedge. I want to shoot an arrow that's 20 centimeters long and I want it to make it through there while the thing is rotating without hitting a spoke. So how fast do I need to shoot the arrow? Okay, so I'm going to use the equation that says distance is equal to velocity times time and I'm going to solve that equation for time. So translating that to angular variables I'm going to divide the angular displacement by the angular velocity. Okay, so if it's rotating two and a half times a second, that's my angular speed, two and a half revolutions per second, and the amount that it displaces is one of those pi wedges, so one eighth of the circle. So that's what I've got. One eighth of a revolution divided by two and a half revolutions per second tells me that I have five one hundredths of a second to get that arrow through that wedge, or through that pie wedge, okay? So, uh, how much, how fast does it have to go? So, the length of the arrow divided by the time it takes should give me the speed. So that comes out to four meters per second. Now, here's a question that the book asks. Does it matter? Would it be easier to get the arrow through if I shot it here, near the center, or if I shot it where there's more room over here, near the edge? No, it doesn't matter, right? Why doesn't it matter? Because the stuff on the outside is moving faster. That's right. Even though we have more space there, the outside of the circle is moving faster, which leads us to this Calvin and Hobbes cartoon. We have a record player over there. We're going to play with it in a, in a few minutes. But for now, uh, playing a record, I'll show you something interesting. Compare a point on the label, which is near the center, with a point on the record's outer edge. They both make a complete circle in the same amount of time, right? Yeah. But the point on the record's edge has to make a bigger circle in the same time, so it goes faster. See, two points on one disc move at two speeds, even though they both make the same revolutions per minute. And then I love the, the artist's rendition of Calvin, you know, laying awake at night in bed, pondering this intricate physics question, like we all do so often, right? <laughs> okay, what I want to do is though, uh, I want to take us out into the quad just for a few minutes, and because I want to do an experiment so that it will help you to remember this always, and when I talk back about, remember that time we went out in the quad, and you'd be like, oh yeah, I remember that. So, let's head out there just for a couple minutes, we're going to do a demonstration. Okay. Joanne and I are going to form the radius of a circle. I'm going to be the center of the circle. Okay, and we're going to rotate in a circle. So hold our arms up. Go ahead, walk in a circle. And I'm the center of the circle. Okay, that's good for now. So as we were moving, we both have the same angular speed, right? We both go around the, the circle the same number of times per minute or per second, however you measure it. But how fast Joanne is having to walk across the ground, that's her linear speed, okay? So we have our angular speed, radians per second, but the linear speed, take the distance she walks and divide it by the time. So you saw that while I rotated, I wasn't going anywhere. So I had zero linear speed. Joanne had some linear speed, but it's different than mine. But we have the same angular speed, okay? Come on out. Hold hands again. Make the, make the circle bigger now. All right. You're gonna, you got to keep up. Ready? Okay, here we go. See? Sean's great. All right. And let's grab one. Add one more on. Here we go. Ready? Go. Keep up. Alex, go faster. There you go. That's it. Excellent. Okay. Good work. Good job. So, good you notice, as we add people on, the further out from the center of the circle, the faster they have to run because they're having to cover more ground in the same amount of time, right? So the larger 
the radius of the circle, the greater the linear speed. But everyone on the line had the same angular speed. Okay, let's head back in. Okay, so if I wanted to describe this circular motion or this angular motion right there, it ha we can use vectors to do that. Okay, so how the speed is how fast it's spinning, right? But how do I describe the direction? If I asked you, which way is this wheel spinning? You would say counterclockwise. But what do I see? I see clockwise. So that doesn't work. So how we get around this is we use something called the right-hand rule. Okay? So that when we, if we all use the right-hand rule to describe the motion of this wheel, we'll all agree on which way it is spinning. So the way you do it is you take your right hand, you put your right hand in, you put your right hand out, you put your right hand in, and then you shake. That's the hokey pokey. The right hand rule goes like this. You take the fingers of your right hand, you turn them in the direction that the wheel is spinning, and the way your thumb points describes the direction of the spin. So right now all of our thumbs are pointing to the back of the room. Doesn't matter if you're on that side or on this side of the wheel, we still agree that's the direction of the spin. And if I were to stand here and do it like this, people over here, people over there, everyone, their thumbs would point that way. Okay? And if I spun it like this, everyone's thumb points to the ceiling. So we all agree on the way the wheel is spinning. So that's called the right hand rule. Now the question is, how do we draw that on a piece of paper? <laughs> Okay. So imagine you've got an arrow. If the arrow points right or left, that's easy to draw. If it points up or down, that's easy to draw. But if it points into or out of the page, you can, if you envision this arrow, if it's sticking into the page, you would see the feathers, right? And that's what it would look like looking at the back of the arrow. And if it was coming out of the page, this point would be poking you right in the face, looking at you, and you would see that. Okay? So into the board is an X with a circle around it. Out of the board is a dot with a circle around it. Okay? That describes our direction of velocity, angular velocity. And notice that it is perpendicular to the plane of the spinning. Right? So if, if I had this circle spinning in the plane of the whiteboard, the vector would be into the board. And it would be perpendicular to the board. So that's always going to be the case. The vector that describes the angular velocity is perpendicular to the plane of the rotation. All right? <clears throat> and it goes for acceleration too. If you want to know what's the direction of the angular acceleration, wrap your fingers in the direction of the net force that's causing it, and you'll come up with the direction of your angular acceleration. Now, for angular displacement, it turns out that we can't use vectors because to use vectors, it has to obey the rules of vector addition. And one of those rules says the order of the addition is not important. But as we're going to show you here, with angular displacement, it makes a difference. Which, so I'm going to use my, my book here. If I rotate it first on the x-axis and then on the y-axis, you can see that this side of the book is now facing you. But if I... Which way did I start? Did I start this way? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. But if I rotate it on the y-axis and then the x-axis, whoops, hold on, the, <laughs> the y-axis and then the x-axis, there we go, I get a different, a different orientation of the book, okay? So y first, then x gives me a different answer than x first, then y. So we can't use uh, vectors for angular displacement, but we can use them for angular velocity and angular acceleration, okay? This poster up here on the wall has been there all year, and we haven't really talked about it at all. You may have seen it. You may have said, I don't care. But today's the day we're going to introduce it. When you look at those equations, you say to yourself, oh, those look kind of familiar. And you might notice they are those equations over there, except those are for linear motion. Now we've got a set of equations for uh, angular motion. Okay. So on the other poster, D stands for displacement. On our new poster, D is replaced with delta theta, our change in angular position. So to use this clock as an example, if I were to start 
at the 9 o'clock position, which says pi radians, and move to the 10 o'clock position, which is 5 sixths pi radians, what is my displacement? What is my angular displacement? Well, we always say theta final minus theta initial. So that would be 5 pi over 6 minus pi equals negative pi over 6. So in other words, I have displaced pi over 6 radians and in the negative direction. Remember, for our coordinate system, it's traditional to move in the positive direction from the positive x-axis. The positive direction is in the counterclockwise direction. So through the first quadrant, then the second quadrant, then the third quadrant, and the fourth quadrant, that's the positive direction. So from moving from here to there, I've moved clockwise, so it's negative displacement, and the amount of it is pi over 6. So I've got both my magnitude and direction that tells me which way I moved and how much I moved. Okay. Remember, if you go plus 270 degrees, you can also say go negative 90 degrees. They both mean the same thing, and in both cases, I'm in the same position afterwards. Okay. So that's on our poster. Delta theta is our angular displacement. Velocity over there is our linear, linear velocity. On this poster over here, omega, the Greek letter omega. It looks like uh, a W, kind of. And uh, that is our angular velocity. And everywhere over here that you see an alpha, that was an A over there for acceleration. So these are our angular equivalents of the linear equations of motion. So uh, delta theta for displacement, omega for angular velocity, and alpha for angular acceleration. Yep. Okay, so the, the similarities, there are a lot of similarities. Even though all the variables have different names, there's still displacement, velocity, and acceleration just now for angular. And as with the linear equations of motion, the same rule applies for the angular equations that says they are only valid when the acceleration is constant, okay? So remember our, our quick rule of thumb to figure out is to look, when you have your equation for angular position as a function of time, if the power on t is two or less, then you know when you take the derivative twice, you're gonna end up with a constant acceleration. If this is three or four or more, then when you take it, the derivative twice, your acceleration equation will have a t in it, and that means it's varying with time. So that, if, if that's the case, you have to rely strictly on this method to go between displacement, velocity, and acceleration. Otherwise, if it's constant acceleration, you can use the equations, which is very common, right? Common scenario. Yes, sir? Wasn't the omega sign like an upside down word? No, here? that's, that's, capital, that's capital, capital, capital omega. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is lowercase. This is lowercase. <laughs> Greek letters, man, those Greeks were smart. They've got uppercase and lowercase letters, yeah. Thinking back to geometry, when we move through a circle, for example, outside, the distance Joanne had to walk, we call that the arc length. So let's say I rotated through 90 degrees from the 3 o'clock position to the 12 o'clock position. This is the circle Joanne moved on, and I forgot who was holding her hand, but the, the person after that, that's, that's how far they had to walk. They had to walk it a further distance, right? Meanwhile, I didn't go anywhere. That's called arc length. We use the letter S. That's measured in meters. If you took a, a ruler and measured that distance on the ground, that's what the arc length would be, okay? How far you go is one thing. How fast you do it is your velocity, of course. So if you divide this equation by time, we're going to change now arc length to our linear velocity or our tangential velocity. They mean the same thing. The linear velocity or the tangential velocity, and that is in meters per second. Arc length was in meters. Tangential velocity is in meters per second. And r is a constant. Dividing the angular displacement by time gives us the angular velocity, r omega. That is our angular variable. And we check our units. On the left side, we have meters per second. On the right side, the radius is measured in meters. Omega is measured in radians per second. But radians is not a real unit. We just have that word to allow us to talk about it and to know what's 
make it easy to, to talk about it. But the real way we write units of radians per second is just one over seconds. Sometimes it's written this way. Uh, meters times seconds to the negative one. Okay? So the units check. Meters per second on the left, meters per second on the right. And then if we divide by time again, now we have the tangential acceleration. This is how much the, the velocity is changing as a function of time. And that's meters per second squared. And d omega dt now is alpha, the angular acceleration, which is radians per second squared. Okay, so this checks again. Meters per second squared is equal to meters per second squared. We call these our linear variables. Arc length, tangential velocity, and tangential acceleration. And we call these our angular variables, theta, omega, and alpha. Angular position, angular velocity, and angular acceleration. If you recall, when we talked about uniform circular motion, as you move in a circle, your velocity is a vector. It has speed and direction. If the speed changes, then that's what we're measuring here with tangential acceleration. That's how much the linear velocity, the VT, is changing per time. But velocity also has direction. How much is, what's the centripetal acceleration? That was the, the change in direction. We proved that it was VT squared, the tangential velocity squared, divided by the radius. So if we use our equation here that says VT is R omega, well, substitute r omega for vt. When you square that, one of the r's crosses off, and I'm left with my centripetal acceleration then, which is a linear variable, is equal to r omega squared, where now this is my angular variable. Okay, So we've got our arc length, our tangential speed, or tangential velocity, our tangential acceleration, and our centripetal acceleration. These four are linear variables, and these three because that's the same as this one, are our angular variables. Okay?